God and ask him what to share. Uh, and for those of you that have been here a while, you know I'm not necessarily a thematic preacher from the standpoint of holidays and such. But I do have a word that is pointed to the fathers today, and you can catch it too, mothers and sisters and everybody that's here. When you have it and you're ready, say amen. Verse 17 says, when he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. 19, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please make me one of your hired servants, or take me on, New Living Translation says, as a hired servant. 20 says, so he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son, verse number 21, said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of be call being called, brother, your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. 23, and kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine, 24, which is where we will stop, was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. And the people of God said, Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. 24 says, So the party began. Uh, if the writer was like me from Oak Cliff, they would say, So the party started to pop off. But how many of you know before the party begins, sometimes before you get to celebrate, you have to go through a process of pain. And as we are here for this Father's Day, I want to share that there are some golden nuggets found in this passage. For you see, in this passage, we have a great illustration of what a great father looks like. And for some of us, we have been messed up in life and we feel like we've missed out on some things in life because we did not have the mirror or the picture of a good father. And even if that is the case and that has been the case or that is the case, we don't get to live our lives in any kind of way because God doesn't excuse us. He provides illustration and example in his word to show us through him and through biblical characters and parables of what a good father looks like. And so today I want to talk about uh, good fathers and from this text I want to share the importance of being a faithful father. But in this text and in the word of God and as God has spoken what I believe to me a word for this day, I want to just talk from the simple subject, four facets of a faithful father. Four facets of a faithful father. Perhaps some of you today don't get excited about Father's Day like most of us do on Mother's Day. Matter of fact, when I was uh, in the store on yesterday thinking that the, the, the place I went to look for some gifts for the men uh, was going to be crowded, I told the lady at the register, I'm glad I could whip in and whip out, but it wasn't like this when I came by on Mother's Day. And even though they had a big sale, sometimes it's hard to see past some of the burdens and the barrage of breakdown that has happened in the family. A lot of times at the hands of the father or the other side of it because there is the neglect of the father. 
And what I want you to know today that as we look at this parable that is so familiar that one of the first things that just jumps out at you is that the father in this passage it is parallel to our heavenly father because there are some facets that he has that God has. And any of us who are fathers today, if you want to know what it looks like to be a faithful father, just look at God and look at the text. Uh, there are many things, but there are five specific things, five facets that I want to focus on pertaining to being a faithful father. First of all, let me tell you, uh, being a father for some 20, going on 22 years, being a father is not easy. And all the fathers say, amen. It may look easy, but it is not easy. Oftentimes, you don't get celebrated. Half the time, you're lucky if you get tolerated. But when God gives you the ability to be a father, it is your responsibility to walk, talk, and act like a father. Truth of the matter, one of the reasons why we are fought so hard because there is so much at stake in our position. But I like this text, and I could take it a number of ways, but I love this text because it begins to share with us some facets that indicate that there's a faithful father. And as we look at the text, if you know the story, I started in verse 17, but if I were to start in verse 11, you will understand that this whole passage, the 15th chapter of St. Luke, deals with lost things. It starts out with dealing with a lost sheep and talking about a shepherd rejoicing one when that one sheep comes back to the fold and is found and, and then it moves and talks about a woman who has a coin that is lost and, and instead of focusing on what she has left, she can't rest until she sweeps the house and finds that that is lost. Then 11 begins to say, in like fashion or in the same manner, depending on your version, that there was a certain man that had, King James Version, two sons, a younger and an older. And you know the story, the, the younger brother comes to his father and he asks him for his inheritance. And the thing that just blew my mind was that the father did not question the son. For you do know that an inheritance is something that you receive after your father has died. Your inheritance is what your father has stored up for you and, and you don't get that until he's gone. But the father divides between them, both the old and the younger, his inheritance. So notice uh, the text says, the younger says, give me, King James Version, the portion of goods that falleth unto me. Well, first of all, who told you you were going to get something in the first place? <laughs> I said he must have been a millennial I'm just joking y'all he was young and sometimes when you're young you, you make certain requests that you don't even know what you're asking for but I marvel at the fact that this faithful father did not withhold what he had from his son but he gave to both of them his substance and in doing so as a result of time and bad decisions what the younger son got in a moment, which could have taken him a lifetime, he lost in a little time. Anytime you get something that you're not ready to handle, you won't have it long. That's why I've learned to pray and ask God, God, don't just bless me with what I want. Bless me to understand, to ask for it in the right time. Because if I don't have it in the right time, I won't take care of what the Father has entrusted to me. And so because he was young and because he was full of vigor but not much wisdom, he took what the Father gave him as an inheritance and he wasted everything the Father had. The questions just start popping up in my head as a father. One of the first questions that popped up in my head and my mind was, why did the Father give him the stuff? <laughs> At least my response, one of many would have been, come back and see me when you get a little older. Another question that pops up in my mind is, how much does this father have? 
for him to divide between them and he still is not struggling. I told you he's symbolic of our heavenly father. You do know the psalmist declares that the cattle on a thousand hills belongs to God. You do know that Paul picks up his pen in Philippians 4 and lets us understand that there is no short in God account. He says God shall supply all of our needs like a good father, like a faithful father, according to his riches which are in glory. The father doesn't ask him a lot of questions. He gives to him and to them rather his or their inheritance and he's still moving. You know you're blessed when you can break other folk off and still be blessed. Uh, I'm digressing but that's the kind of way I want God to bless me. I want God to bless me so good that by the time I bless somebody else I can still keep my step. I want God to bless me so good that my kids don't have to wonder where the blessing comes from because they know God put a father who was faithful in my life and he's always taken care. I'm just talking about four facets of a faithful father. And so you know the story, the younger son took what the father gave him and he wasted it on riotous living. And when he had money, he had false friends. When he had substance, he didn't have to struggle. But sooner or later, I don't know who this is for, but sooner or later, when you mismanage what the master gives, you're going to find yourself in a mess. And so what happens over time, as he goes far away from home, and some of you young people, let me tell you, you keep saying, I can't wait to get grown and own my own. There will come a time, I know you won't believe me today, there will come a time when you'll be saying, I wish I was back at mama and dad and them's house. I know you don't believe me right now, but it's true. So instead of investing, instead of uh, starting a business, he blows the resources. I asked myself, how long did it take this father to accumulate his wealth? Only to see a son blow it in a matter of moments. Well, oftentimes you and I have to wonder and watch out for parents. We have to watch out and, and wonder what we're going to do with the investment that we've built. Because until they're ready to really receive, they will mismanage what you call to be a blessing in their lives. And so uh, the other question that popped in my mind was, why doesn't this father flinch? He's interesting. He's faithful, but he's interesting because he just, according to the text, he just gives it to him. You ever read that text and you just wondered? I know my kids asked me for $20. And I got about 20 questions before I give up 20 bucks. And the father gives an inheritance, no questions asked. Just some things if uh, Reverend Arsenio was here he would say things that make you go hmm some of y'all old enough to know what I'm talking about Come on. they're facets that push this father to be faithful enough to give his substance are you ready to hear him say yes, yes. the first facet I want to focus on is found in verse number 11 look at verse 11 you can scroll up in your, your word to illustrate the point further what point the point about being lost and being found Jesus told them this story a man had two sons the youngest son verse 12 told his father listen New Living Translation he didn't ask he told his father I want my share of your estate you're looking like a big shot big ball and a shot caller I want to do like you you're driving in your Bentley where is mine I want my stuff and I want it now not he says, give it to me now before you die. So his father agreed. That, that's the problem I have right there. His father agreed to divide his wealth between his son. And he gives it to them. But here, here's what I want you to know. Uh, the first facet of a faithful father is that faithful fathers provide for their children. Yeah, man. 
Uh, whether you like it or not, understand the text or not, I'm going to explain it but by the time I'm done. The faithful father provides for his children. Both. Only one took advantage of the opportunity to get his stuff and to go see what he could do with it, even though he had, you know, <laughs> some issues. Both of them had the inheritance. But here's what I want you to know. One of my downloads is simply this. You have to have an inheritance to give an inheritance. And some of us would be in trouble if something were to happen to us. We wouldn't be considered faithful fathers. Uh, don't, don't get too uncomfortable. I'm just preaching the word and just trying to challenge us today because the Bible says, I believe it's Proverbs chapter 13, verse number 22, that a good man leaves an inheritance not just for his children, but for his children's children. But this father, first of all, provides for his children. I, I know some people do it, but as a father, I, I don't understand how you can have life on the planet and not provide for your seed. I, I know some people do it, but I just, I just have a hard time because I know God's going to hold me responsible for how I provide and guide for those he's given me. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. So I, I hear some of you thinking, you say, well, it's easy for the father in the text to give an inheritance because he's got a lot. L let me help you. Inheritance is not just about money. One of the reasons that many of our young boys and young men and young girls grow up with self-esteem issues is because the father has not loved enough to provide. And to be in a position of providing, you got to be faithful. Now, I'm going to show you in this text that the father was faithful to provision. Not just one time, but over and over again. He's faithful because he knows it's his job to provide. But even if you don't have a lot of money, I want to challenge you to leave an inheritance. You may not have a lot of cash, but if you've got character, you can leave an inheritance. Well, what are you trying to say, Pastor James? It ain't always just about money, Daddy. If nothing else, leave them an inheritance by giving them you. What are you talking about? Give them, if you can't give them millions in the bank, teach them how to be a man. If you can't give them millions in the bank, at least give them your work ethic. But the problem is some of us as fathers don't have work ethic. That's why your son is having the blues with his mama because you may not even be in the house, but all she tells him is that you just like your... I don't know about anybody else, but it's just too transparent. But I want it to be a compliment when somebody says to my son, you're going to be just like your daddy. Can I get a witness? I, I'm going to hurry up and get out your way, but I just felt this all in my spirit this week and wanted to let you know that it is our job as fathers to, number one, provide for our children. Where will we get this concept? I told you the father in Luke 15 is symbolic of our heavenly father. Amen. And one thing I can tell you about my heavenly father is that he is a faithful father because of facet number one. He is always provided. It may not have been what I wanted, but guess what? It's always been what I needed. It may not have been when I wanted, but guess what? It's always been on time. The reason I can trust God today is because I trusted him 22 years ago when I became a father. And before I became a father, are you hearing what I'm saying? Faithful fathers, number one, provide for their children. And I know we don't have any in here, but, but maybe your cousin or maybe a neighbor or maybe someone who you know needs to hear this message. You will let them download the app and share this word with them because we need to remind ourselves that faithful fathers provide for their children. They ought to be better because you and I are here. Are you hearing me? If nothing else, give them you. If you can't give them your character and you can't give them your work ethic, at least give them your tenacity. Uh, I'm going to get back to it in just a moment, but that's one of the reasons why I believe the father gave to the son. Because he knew that sooner or later there was going to come a crossroad. 
you can't give them your work ethic and your character and your tenacity, give them your creativity. Some of you know how to make it work. You don't even have a degree, but you're a shade tree mechanic. Teach them how to change the oil. Uh, are you hearing me? Uh, my cousin blessed me because she, she was saying that she got back from a trip. Her sister was telling me out of town, out of the country, and when she got back, she had a flat tire, and she was saying, just upset about it, but then uh, the sister said, do you need me to send somebody? She said, no. Now, my uncle's been dead for years. She says, no, because my daddy taught me how to change a tire. In the grave, but still helping out baby girl because even though he may not have left her millions, he, oh, come on, come on, he taught her how to manage life because life will get hard. And the sooner we realize that, the better off we will be. And I want to just slide in a side message to children, no matter what your age is. The thing that helps us remain faithful as fathers is not only when we provide for our children, it's children understanding that you should not always be on the side of take. Because, you know, especially you girls, let me just talk to y'all for a moment. Y'all know that when you're born, you get most of us dads, like Hannah, we wrap, y'all wrap us around your little finger. And all you got to do is ask. I'm looking at my father-in-law because I know him. All you got to do is ask. <laughs> but don't always ask. A, a good child makes an even better parent because when my children don't ask me for everything, it wants me to bless them with more things. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? <sighs> Number one facet of a faithful father is that a faithful father is a provider. I'm moving, but can we just give God a praise break for all the many years he's provided for us? And some of us don't even tithe nor tip, but he keeps on providing. Some of us won't even come to church, but on Mother's Day, we skip and he still provides. Some of us don't even have the, the ability to thank God, not the ability, but we have the attitude where we won't even thank God for the air we breathe. He doesn't even charge us morning by morning. You ought to just take a praise break. And whether your father in the, in the natural is alive, you ought to thank God for your heavenly father who keeps on keeping on in your life. As bad as you and I were, he still blessed us. As much as we messed up, he still comes to our rescue. And how many times did you say, God, if you give me some more money, I won't blow it like I did last time and you still blew it, but he still kept blessing. Come on, preacher. Mm, God, let me hurry up. The fathers are hungry. Children, don't just be on the tape. But God gives you a, a father who will bless you because you never know when you got to bless him. Number one, faithful fathers provide for their children. But look down, I'm going to take you through the text, scale back down to verse number 20. Verse 20. I, I can't, it's hard. I, I got to get to 20, but I can't get to 20 without bringing up 17. Come on. 17 in the King James says, when he finally came to himself. Come on. The reason I talk to you young people to let you know that you, you shouldn't always be on the take because sooner or later, life's going to hit you so hard that you got to come to yourself. Well, when did he come to himself? He came to himself of the moment that his line of credit ran out from his father. Yeah. And he's in a hog's pen now, moved from a father's palatial palace to being in a hog's pen, hungering for the things, the slop that the pigs did He, But he comes to himself. Have you ever been in a position or a place that you didn't supposed to be in and you had to come to yourself and remind yourself that even though I'm in a pit, I'm a, I am rather a king's kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, even though... I'm in this place because decisions that I made, he takes responsibility for his actions. That's a whole other message. He starts rehearsing a speech on his way home. It goes like this. How many servants wow. live in my father's house who are eating good and my stomach's grumbling while I'm in here with the pigs? He says, I will arise and go to my father. Yeah. And we'll say to him, you ever had your hat in your hand? You know, you, you're practicing your speech. Uh, I'm sorry, I messed it up. I'll, I'll just ask him. I'm not trying to, you know, get a position. I just want to get in the house. Yeah. 
I left high, but I got to come back low. And he says, when I get there, if I get an audience with my father, all I'm going to ask him, not to put my name plate back on my door or my desk, I'm just going to ask him, uh, give me a job where I can serve. Notice what he says. He says, for I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Woo! The daddy said, when you leave this house, make sure you remember your Jenkins. But when he left the house with some cash and coins in his pocket, he didn't act like him. So he says, I, I got to go home and just, you know, get back in the crib and, and work, work my way back up. But, but uh, the second facet of a faithful father shows up yeah. from verse 20 to verse 22. Uh, in those verses, you will find that when the son shows up, not the good son, not the goody two shoes, but the one who blew it. All right. He comes with his prepared speech saying, Daddy, I know I messed up. Uh, Y'all have any openings? Minimum wage, something is better than where I've been. The Bible says, first of all, his father saw him from afar off. And instead of waiting on him to come to the father, he goes and meets him, grabs him, hugs him, and kisses him, and then says to the staff, bring the best robe, bring the best ring, and get the ribs ready. Come on. What I want you to see is the second facet is that not only are faithful fathers providers, but faithful fathers are forgivers. They forgive their children. Amen. Amen. And I know it's nobody in here, but I, I know people who haven't talked to their father in years simply because there was an offense and the father didn't forgive or the child didn't forgive. But here's what I need you to know. Oftentimes it's the father that has to be the bigger person and to start the forgiving process. Now, I love my children. I love our children. I just don't know. And I believe I'm saved. You say, you should be, you pastor in the church. I, I, just stay with me for a second. I believe I'm saved, but I just don't know, I would like to think, I just don't know if it would go this smoothly. If I gave Jonathan my his inheritance, what I worked hard for, and, and he wasted on riotous living with wild women and, and drinking, and you know the stuff some of y'all used to do. My God, come on, preacher. And he comes home, and instead of asking no questions again, the father says, Get him back in his place. Same place. Why? Because a faithful father is forgiving. And truth of the matter is, all of us need the father's grace from time to time. Can you imagine how this younger son feels? He feels not only the provision of the father, but he receives the forgiveness of the father. Can you imagine how the rest of his life is going to change? Okay, let me see if I can bring this up to speak. Not only are faithful fathers providers, but they forgive their children. Notice what the father does. He forgives with no strings attached. You ever had anybody forgive you, but they got all these webs and strings attached to it? The father forgave him at face value. I, I hear in my mind and my spirit, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, where it defines love for us. And one of the things that one version says about love is that love keeps no record of wrong. If you're going to have a good relationship with your child or your children, you got to learn how to provide, but also to forgive. And forgive in the manner to where you keep no records of wrong. He forgives because he's faithful. Can, can I say something to you? Say yes. yes. What God does with a father, because he wants us to be the first image and model of what our heavenly father is to our children. And truth of the matter, the reason that some people don't trust God is that they didn't trust their natural father. But the good news is, it is not too late. Help me preach it. Just look, look at your neighbor and tell him, it is not too late. 
faithful fathers forgive their children. I'm, I'm learning a lot from this faithful father. Because truth to be known, I might would have had some conditions. Am I the only one? Amen. You can come back, but I got to give you a curfew, you, Brother Bailey. You can come back, but I'm going to put you on a strict allowance. You can come back, but I'm going to watch your every move. That's it. You follow me? But a faithful father is forgiving. And I'm, I'm not saying that some of us don't need that kind of structure. I'm just saying sometimes I'm stretching my faith with what I see in the text. I'm just showing four facets of a faithful father. Number one, faithful fathers provide for their children. And number two, faithful fathers forgive their children. Look at the text with me one more time. 20 says... So he returned home to his father. And while he was a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, not judgment and resentment. He ran to embrace his son and kissed him. Now that's whole much in here. I'm going to move fast, but, but do you see it? One of the reasons that he does so, because he loves his son. But the text says, when he was on his way home, he saw him from a long way off. And here's what I want you to know. Uh, the father uh, was looking for the son. Why? Because the third facet of being a faithful father I want to share with you quickly is that a faithful father is a provider. A faithful father is a forgiver. But then a faithful father, number three, believes in his children. I believe that the father simply believed that I follow the manual in the word of God that reminds me in Proverbs 22 and 6 that if I train up a child in the way that he should go, I don't know when, but I'm going to keep looking. But one day when he's old, he won't depart from it. I just believe here's the other reason why I believe he didn't ask a whole lot of questions on the front end around verse 11 going into 12 when he divided his substance between his sons is because I think part of the reason was he believed in his son and when you believe in your children you'll fund things won't nobody else fund when you believe in your children you'll do for them what nobody else will do for them when you believe in them you'll want them to go out and see what they can do by swimming in the bad you may not get a home run you may strike out but perhaps if you keep swinging you'll learn how to hit the ball Amen. so number three he believed in his son that's what faithful fathers do here's why so many people miss the father in their life because people can tell you left and right you do well, especially for those of us as men. It takes things to a whole nother level when your father who gave you the seed sees something in you and says that I believe in you. That's why even as a pastor I try to make it a point to tell you as much as I can, I believe in you. Because we all need to know that somebody other than God believes in us. Are you hearing me? How do I know he believes in the son? Not only did he give him his substance on the front end, but when he came back on the back end, he gave to him again. Why? Because he believes in him. Where did we find this concept again? From a faithful father called God. You you know what he told Jeremiah to write in the 29th chapter in the 11th verse? Get this. While Israel was in captivity, he says, I still believe in you. How can you tell me you believe in me while you allowed us to go into bondage? Get this. I believe in you because if you don't, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts to prosper you and to give you an expected end. Come on, preacher. Do you not know God believes in you because he's a faithful father? And if you don't remember much, I want you to remember going after the day that when you even start to doubt yourself, just preach to yourself and say, Pastor James told me, God believes in me. If your father never picked up the phone or texted you or tweeted to tell you he loved or believed in you, I came to tell you, God and me believe in you. Yeah. 
Now you just got to do like the son in 17. Come to yourself and believe in yourself. Because when you believe in yourself and the father believes in you, that's when there is agreement. Here is why I believe he gave him back some stuff. Because he has belief in his son. Here's what else you need to see. He believes in his son. But another reason I think he didn't try to talk him out of it because he was a younger son. Is this reason right here? Because he know, he knew rather, that it's hard to talk somebody young out of leaving and how to manage money until they learn a lesson. Or as I like to paraphrase it by saying, a wise father knows sometimes children won't listen till they learn a lesson. And if you don't hear much else, understand life is filled with lessons. Some of you already know you, you're taking uh, lesson 101 for the fifth time, but I want to help you if you just humble yourself and, and, and let God, the master father, teach you a lesson, you can move to the next grade. Sometimes we, we have to let our children like the father does experience some things when they won't listen on their own. Just so they realize that after I learned this lesson, notice prior to the lesson, he's walking in pride. But post lesson, he walks in humility. And that's what happens. Oftentimes, the father will allow us to get ourselves in trouble because he knows even if we won't listen to him, we'll listen after we have a bad lesson. Am I talking to anybody? And here's another reason why, as I asked God for the answers, he began to download to me, I believe, why he allowed the son to go the way that he did. And even why he allows you and I to go through the furnace of affliction. You want to know why? Say yes. Otherwise, I'll think you're ready to go eat some ribs. The reason that God allows as his father gave and allowed the son to blow it is because, he, number one, he has free will. But number two, he begins to let him know that you can learn some lessons. But number three, one of the greatest lessons that you learn does not come during times of prosperity, but during times of pain. And here is the lesson. If you're taking notes, this is a good point. The Father, just like our Heavenly Father, allows us to experience affliction because what affliction does is that it provides affirmation. Come on, priest James, I'm trying. What the affliction in your life and in the younger son's life and in my life does, it affirms two things. Good God Almighty. Number one, it affirms that no matter what you get yourself into, your Heavenly Father is waiting to forgive you as soon as you come to yourself. But number two, it also affirms that even though you're dealing with affliction, affliction does not change my birth certificate. Because even though he went through, he thought he was through being a son, all that trouble did was affirm that he's still a son. Oh, y'all missed the shouting point right there. After he blew it, after he spent his money and he's broke, he comes back to the house only to find out he's got a faithful father who will still provide, who will also still forgive, and who still believes in him. And I don't care how strong you are. You can tell me what you want, but I know I'm telling the truth. Every one of us needs somebody to believe in us. And especially our fathers. Folk are still running today trying to impress the ghost of their father because he never told them he believed in them. But the father allowed him to go through this affliction because what the affliction did was affirm his relationship. Well, why do you say it? The text says he has this great speech. Once he gets himself together in 17, he's on his way back to the house in 20. He just wants a job. Help me preach that that ain't good enough. Why? The reason that's not good enough is because what happened when he left and he blew the father's substance. There was a breach, but the breach was in their fellowship. 
The breach was not in their relationship. And if you don't get saved for any other reason, here's a good reason to get saved. Because when you become saved, you become a son. And when you are a son, you may still not practice a lifestyle, but still commit a sin. But committing a sin doesn't disqualify you from being a son. Because it's not just the fellowship, it's the relationship. And that's why he says, you're talking crazy. Now, if you would have left as an employee, I would have hired you back. But you left as a son, so you got to come back as a son because even you, even though you did what you did, all the while you were doing what you were doing, you still had my blood running through you. All the while you were acting like you didn't want to be a part of this family, your bloodline said you were still in the family. Am I talking to anybody? You may not understand the imagery. I ain't talking about your natural father now, but God saves you and you thought I'm saved, but I still want to do my own little thing. So if you wild oats till I get older and God wanted me to tell you you may have get out, gotten out there on your own but it ain't too late to come home because your father is still a provider he still believes in you and he still has a hope for your future he says make me one of the hired servants I can't make you something that you're not whether I like it or you like it you're a son any parents, fathers, mothers, have your children ever done anything that you didn't approve of? Every hand ought to go up. But you didn't go get their birth certificate and put some white out on it. Even if you did, the white out won't stop that red blood running through their veins from being your son. Some of you country people know what I'm talking about. You go to the country. You don't even have to tell anybody. Ain't you Mama Bee's boy? How you know you got that round head like all the John? Can, can I, I'm almost finished. But, but preach to yourself. Say this. I'm still a son. Yeah. I may have blown it. I may have mismanaged some finances. I may have been hanging with the wrong women or the wrong men, but guess what? On Father's Day, that bald-headed pastor told me, I'm still a son. I may have had, guess what? Some issues even in the family. But my life and my mistakes and even my brother who can't stand that I get blessed. Oh God can stop me from being a son. So I left off in verse 24. 24 says, New Living Translation, and the party began. I'm Fred Hammond. The party is popping off. Everybody in the party, except for one person. Here come the elder brother. What's going on? I've been in the house working and I ain't never messed up. What's all this music? I didn't get an invitation. The servant says, uh, uh, Master, um, party's going on, but everybody in there except for older brother. He, he, he upset. I don't know what's wrong with him, but you need to go talk to him. So daddy goes to talk to him and he says, well, what the problem is? He says, I, I hear all this music and dancing and pocket talk you know, they, you know, anyway, what y'all do at the family, you know, it's going down, right? He says, oh, I don't understand. Explain something to me. Help me, he used Pastor James' word, help me understand, Daddy. Why in the world would you throw a party for this brother of mine who wasted, he reminds him, you know how folk would do, they'll remind you of your mistakes. He says, he wasted all of your substance and your resources with riotous living and with harlot women and, and, and you're going to throw a party with him and, and get this, I've been here with you all this time and you ain't never even asked my friends to come over and have a little barbecue goat, but you got the fatty calf for him. What's up with that? <laughs> the father comes back to him and he says, uh, you understand something. Let me let me explain something to you. Let me let me let me explain so I can make it plain to you. 
<laughs> There's a reason that this party is popping off. And the reason that I can still have this party, because you have to understand, my son was lost. It was just like he was dead, but he's come home. And he is alive. The enemy tried to take him out. But I was praying for him all the while. Uh, and, and you got to understand, first of all, let me clue you in on something too. Notice what he says to the older brother. He says to the older brother, oh, first of all, you got to understand, don't trip out because I'm giving him a little something. You do know, according to the Levitical law, that the older brother got the majority of the inheritance anyhow. Notice what the father says to him. The father says to him, understand that all that I have is thine. In other words, you could have had a party anytime you wanted to. You got the same amount of blessing that your brother got, but you didn't do nothing. Stop hating on folk who at least do something when you don't want to do nothing. But complain. You had enough money, you could have had your own party. You could have rented out the rich Carlton if you wanted to. But you're going to sit here and cry because the Father has bestowed grace on somebody. Your problem in your place is not to talk to the Father and tell him who to have grace for. You don't want to get into that game. Because truth of the matter, older brothers, ain't none of us worthy, but we're all in the family. Your sin may not be my sin, but just like he spent his money on riotous living and with Hollis and drinking that 40, you've been walking around here with pride ever since he left. Thinking you're better than your brother. And you're all worse off. How in the world can you say you love God the Father who you've never seen and you can't even love your brother who you see every day? You can't even go to his party. I try to help folk and tell them you can learn who your friends are and who really loves you and even in your family. Not by who cries with you when you cry, but look at who comes to the party when it's your time to celebrate. If they're, if they're about to choke on the chicken wing, they ain't really for you anyway. Just keep praying for them. Everybody's not for you. This older brother is legalistic. This older brother feels like he the only one deserves what God's grace and his goodness is. You got to be careful when you start thinking you're the only one deserve what the father has. That's why you got to be very careful even in your natural family that you don't play games and you start talking to yourself about you always a favorite. Now I have there's 10 of us and, and I always say that one of the things I love about my mother even though it's Father's Day is that well, even though she has 10 children she has a funny way of making us all feel like we're her favorites. But truth be known, everybody knows me. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> you got to be careful. Come on, that while you're trying to receive God's grace, you miss opportunities to be like God and extend yeah. his grace. Because truth be known, it's not for us to be like the son. But the real hero in the story is the father. Come on, give God some praise for being a father who forgives his children, who provides for his children, who believes in his children. And number three, not only does he do those things, number four rather, the last thing I want to tell you that this father does, and I have to start mentioning it in this text from 20 to 24, is that he protects his children. A faithful father will not just provide. He will not just forgive. He will not just believe in. But he will protect his children. You hear what I'm saying? That's why the Bible says, you know, if you're really going to come and mess up, the enemy's going to mess up in the house, first thing he got to do is, is tie up the strong man. Because a real man ain't going to let the enemy just come and run rush out into his family and take his children. They may not listen like the sun, but you can still pray, cover, and protect. Sometimes you got to fight, sometimes you got to watch, and sometimes you got to pray. But that all comes with the package. Are you hearing me? So number four, faithful fathers protect their children. I wish we could get back to the day where there was reverence for God and reverence for the Father. There used to be a time when folk would reverence a father because a father would protect 
You, you just couldn't say or do anything you wanted to the children around the father. Nowadays, half of us ain't around. And I'm, I'm challenging somebody. I'm not talking about anybody, but I want to challenge you. It's not too late to be the kind of father who's faithful. Are you hearing me? I know there are circumstances that come on the horizon that sometimes as a father you can't control. But what you can control is how you protect, provide, believe in, and provide for your children. Okay, I'm almost finished. Give me five minutes, maybe three and a half. Don't wait till the court force you to provide. They may tell you what you can't do, but I want to tell you what you can do. You can still protect by prayer. You can still protect by showing up. If you can't go to the house, is this too real for some folks? You, you can't go to the house, go to the school. It's your job to protect. And let me say this, we don't get it right all the time. One of the hardest jobs you can have is a father or a parent. And what I'm saying to all of us is We may not have it 100% right But we can all improve And it doesn't stop when they turn 17 or 18 Truth of the matter That's where some of the good teaching can start uh, I'm talking about being A faithful father Just four facets You gotta provide you got to, again, forgive and you got to protect and believe in. If I were to ask your children, do you do those, at least those four things, what, what would they tell me? And if you're curious about that, it's a good time to go uh, and do some adjustments in that area. And so what I want you to know is that faithful fathers protect the children. Notice what the father says. The father says... We had to celebrate. There's no time to have a pity party. I was in a place where I couldn't celebrate because I didn't know. Can you imagine having a son in the world and not knowing what your son was doing when you sent him off with a pocket full of money? Only to realize that some of what you put in him showed up when he came to himself. And that's my prayer. God, I know I'm not perfect as a father, but, but at least let me drop some nuggets so that when life hits them hard, they can come to themselves. Even if something happens when uh, they don't plan it, let, let them see the dad and say, he didn't give us a whole lot of money, perhaps, but, and that's why I'm working on inheritance too, but, but at least he taught me how to take a licking and keep on ticking. All I'm saying is that they're watching us, fathers. They're watching to see how we handle this life. They're watching to see if we will have their back and protect them. That's why we get this novel idea again from the word of God. When it comes to a father protecting, there is nobody that can protect you like God. Matter of fact, when God finally got tired of the Egyptians, he said to Moses to tell Pharaoh, I sent all these other plagues and he didn't get it. But I know he's a father, so he'll get this. Tell him since he's been keeping my firstborn in bondage, I'm going to raise the stakes and I'm going to kill every firstborn in Egypt. That'll move him. And you know what happened? It did. Because it ain't nothing like your baby this burden that'll break your heart and cause you to have to cry to God or make a change. That's why David says in the 27th number of Psalms when he talks about our God being a protector, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When my enemies and my foes came upon me to eat up my flesh because my God provided and protected for me, they stumbled and fell. I like what Mo said in Deuteronomy when he says when my enemies even when they come in at me one way because my father is a protector they gonna flee seven ways looking for a toll to get out of the way of my God because he don't play by his kids that's why you don't even have to fight vengeance is mine saith the Lord show up in faith and see won't God wipe out your enemy show up in faith and see won't God provide when you don't know where your next meal is coming from show up in faith and see that God won't tell you when it feels like you're a failure I still believe in you yeah. Yeah. stand to your feet 
So all this happened in this little story. The father had to get the son straight, the oldest son. Because what he didn't understand was it was a reason to party. And notice what happened. Your forgiving God who has no strings attached. Now, that's not to say that you don't have to reap what you sow. Sometimes that's what he did in the pit. Don't miss me. But when he got back, guess what the father did? It blows my mind again. Last thing that blew my mind. He didn't give him that lecture, you know, your daddy gave you and your mind gave me. I never shall forget. I mean, I go. Never shall forget. I was playing with my brother, horsing around at my uncle's shop, and, and ended up going through a plate glass window. I still had a mark to show it today, and I had to forgive because I I went and I got in trouble. But I went to my daddy, thinking he's gonna have pity on me. <laughs> we need some of that toughness. He said, "You shouldn't have been out there no way." I'm like, "Wait, man, I'm cut. I got to go get stitched." <laughs> My point to you is simply this. The moral of this message is that there were a whole lot of things that happened to the son while he was outside the house. What the house symbolized was the covering. What it symbolized is the security. What it symbolized was the favor of the Father. And what the enemy's job is to do is to pull us out the house. Sometimes he pulls us out by pride. See, he's going to give it to you anyway. If you, if you come on out on your own, then you can manage your own money because your daddy's old and foggy. There are some new things that you need to do. But he tries to get you to leave the house because when you're outside of the house you're on your own you, you, you walk from under the covering oh it looks easy to manage that mansion but you don't know all your daddy had to go through to keep everything in order and so what I want you to understand is that because he was so forgiving and because he was a provider, when he comes back, I told you what the affliction did was affirming. That's why the psalmist says in Psalms 119, 69 going into 70, it was good for me that I was afflicted. Because when he comes back, if he doesn't know anything else the rest of his life, he knows that he is still a son. He wants a minimum wage job. But the daddy says, no, no, no. Go put a ring on his finger. Go put a robe on him. Go get him some Reeboks, Texas shoes, but work with me. And get him some ribs that fall off the bone. Because he's still my son. And so I need you to understand that when God protects you as a faithful father, because of the facets of being a provider, being a forgiver, and being a believer, and being a protector, his job is to supply. Our job is to stay in the house. That's my final thought to you. Help me preach and just tell your neighbor, stay in the house. No matter how much your elder brother's getting on your nerves. I think that's one of the reasons why he may have left the house. But stay in the house. It may get tight while you're there and you can't do all you think you ought to do. But just stay in the house. I'm talking to somebody else who's ready to throw in the towel. It's not your son. It's your spouse. And you're ready to leave. The stay in the house. It's just a mirage in the pig pen. Everything that looks fine doesn't always mean it ain't a fool. Stay in the house. Oh, God, help me preach. Your covering is in the house. The enemy will play with your mind and tell you, you, you don't need to keep going to church. Ain't nothing to that church thing. The, the pastor want to tell you, stay in the house. He's trying to lure you out. The reason that the sheep got lost is because it left the fold. The enemy's job, his number one tactic is to divide so he can conquer. But I want to tell you, stay in the house. Why 
bless you to stay in the house, Pastor, because there's safety in the house. Why should I stay in the house? Because there's security in the house. Why should I stay in the house? There's love in the house. There's forgiveness in the house. There's hope in the house. There's joy in the house. There were problems in the pit, but there was peace in the house. I don't know about you, but the enemy times in my life have tried to get me to leave the house. You ain't got to listen to the Father no more. Everybody out there having fun. Don't you want to have fun? Can I help you? There's some fun in the house. But the kind of fun that's in the house is the kind that you don't have to worry about after the fun is over. There's a whole lot of fun outside the house. That is nothing but a trick and a temptation. I like to have the kind of fun in the house that I don't have to worry about what's going to happen after the fun is over. I'm talking to somebody. Are you hearing me? The safety in the house. Stay there, stay there. Some of you have been coming to this church. God says, keep coming. God says, even ratchet up another notch. Get involved because your blessing is in the house. Because when you get in the house, you understand it's not just about me. It took the young son time to learn. He comes back in humility saying, I don't want to just get what's in the house for me. Make me a servant. Let me serve. So I want to challenge you to stay in the house. But it ain't easy to stay in the house. This was almost my message, but I want to talk to at least one father, two, ten, or twenty. How many are here? Uh, not only do I want you to stay in the house, but I want you to stay strong, my brother. It's hard out here being a man of God. The world laughs at us and tells us that we don't have to take the precautions that we do, but, but, but stay in the house and stay strong, my brother. It's hard doing this. Some of you know what it's like to do it as a single father. Stay strong, my brother. You can make it. Some of you know how to do it with little resources. But if you stay in the house and just remain faithful of a few things, God will make you ruler.